everyone. This is exciting. Welcome to Aeolian Talks for Wards 9 and 10. Tonight we'll meet some of the candidates running for City Council. We'll get to know who they are and what they stand for so you can make an informed decision on Election Day, which is so very important. So thank you for coming out and getting involved, for being engaged. I am Christine Teleski, and I'm honoured to be your host this evening. And I, I want to start by saying thank you to Andrew and the Aeolian Hall for organizing and hosting these events. I also want to thank all the candidates for, for being here and for being prepared uh, for the information they're going to provide this evening. And thanks to you folks as well for coming out in person. Um, let's meet the candidates in wards 9 and 10. Starting from the far left, I guess it's your left, my right, uh, we have for ward 9, Ben Charlebois. Next to Ben, we have, thank you, Veronica Warner. Also for Ward 9, uh, Kyle Thompson for Ward 9. Matt Miller for Ward 9. Um, uh, for Ward 10, Gary Manley. Also for Ward 10, Virginia Ridley. For Ward 9, Anna Hopkins. For Ward 10, Paul Van Meerbergen. And for Ward 10, Kevin May. And as Andrew mentioned, there was one candidate also for Ward 10, Thomas Risley, who we did expect this evening. Unfortunately, he is not here. So as you uh, can tell, that the wards are mixed up. Um, we drew randomly numbers uh, before we started, so the seat numbers are randomly assigned. I will make sure to make it clear which candidate belongs to which ward, so there's no confusion. Their names and wards will also be displayed behind them on the screen when they're talking, so there shouldn't be any confusion there. So here is the format. Each candidate will have one minute for an opening statement. Following that, we will move through a series of key topics, and each candidate will have up to two minutes to present their platform on that topic. And those have been provided in advance, so you should be expecting some really thoughtful, detailed presentations there. There will be no rebuttals during that portion. This is an information portion of the debate or of the uh, presentation. Uh, following that, we will have time for some questions from the audience or perhaps from myself as well. Um, these will be one minute responses and I will grant rebuttals if I think it's acceptable. Um, I think that's about it. I think it's time to get started. Are you guys ready? Yeah. All right, wonderful. I would like to invite for Ward 9, Ben Charlebois up to the podium to present his opening statement. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for having us here. I'm, I'm Ben. Um, I'm running in Ward 9 because I think that right now, London is at a moment where we need more active leadership. And I think right now we need to think bigger than we've thought before. Nearly everyone I've spoken to can think of at least one thing that we should have gotten done years ago, sometimes even decades ago. Green bins, transit upgrades, the ring road. All of these things have been punted because we haven't had leaders interested in thinking big and showing Londoners a vision that they can get behind. So my background, uh, most recently, I've worked in government and I've seen effective grassroots advocacy and ineffective grassroots advocacy. And what we have here is unfortunately very little grassroots advocacy on things that matter. So I'm hoping that I can bring some energy and some experience in politics to city council so that I can help London build a vision of a competitive, livable city and I'm running in Ward 9 to make sure that that vision works for the people of Ward 9. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Also for Ward 9, Veronica Warner. My name is Veronica Warner. Thank you for having me. Um, I feel humbled, humbled and honored to be nominated for this responsibility, and I consider this job a voice for the people. Um, in Byron, as we all know, we've had very lengthy and unorganized construction for the past two years. Um, the Oxford Street West extension is not being used for what it was intended to be used for. It is a four-lane bridge that could alleviate some of our trucks that are running through Byron. As we all know, the Snake Hill is on our agenda for 2033 so that it can be flattened out and realigned into baseline, which um, really, if we could get the big trucks out of Byron from the people that I have talked to behind my hairdressing chair in Byron and in the park, 
that is our biggest issue right now, and um, boy, would we be happy. Mm -hmm. um, okay, thank you, Veronica. Thank you. That is your time. <laughs> Next, Kyle Thompson for Ward 9. Kyle. I'm Kyle Thompson, and uh, I'm excited at uh, the prospect of representing the communities I grew up in, in Ward 9, uh, down at City Hall for the next four years. I'm a firefighter, a husband, a dad, and a fairly substandard musician. Um, what I'm not is a, uh, a politician in any sense of the word, uh, which sounds kind of odd considering what we're doing here tonight, but it's true. Uh, I know very little about the inner workings of politics, but what I do know is people, and I know a lot about people and a lot of them at that. When I have questions about transit in the city, I call up my buddy who drives for the LTC. If I've got a question about policing, I'll go out for coffee with one of my cop buddies. Um, at the end of the day, is that not the only role that counselors should be playing at this level? Uh, ask questions, get answers, bring them forward so that the voice of the people is heard downtown. I have absolutely no ego. I did uh, at one time, but I'm married now. Um, I'll never stand up here and pretend to have all the answers, but uh, I can promise you that I will draw from my never-ending list of contacts to get you the answers that you need and bring them forward. Thanks for listening. Okay. Thanks, Kyle. <laughs> Next is Matt Miller, also for Ward 9. All right, you'll have to bear with me here. I'm not much for public speaking, and I haven't had a lot of time to prepare, as I'm really busy this time of year since. As you may or may not know, I'm a farmer and also a professional computer geek on the side. My name is Matt Miller, and my grandfather started Miller Berry Farms about 60 years ago now, so my family has been a big part of the Lambeth community for three generations. I've lived here my whole life, and I've experienced both the good and the bad after being annexed into the City of London in 1993. I'm on the younger side, and my political experience is limited to arguing on social media, but uh, I was urged to run for council by friends, family, and neighbors after helping to organize our fight against the city, allowing a slaughterhouse and livestock operation on a small property right in the middle of our neighborhood. This is all a new experience for me, but I'm eager to learn, and I want to see our city, and especially our local communities, thrive. I think it's a real shame that so many people feel ignored and disconnected from local politics, and I'm here to make sure that everyone can have their voice represented in City Hall. Thank you, Matt. For Ward 10, Gary Manley. Evening, folks. I am Gary Manley. I am married and have two children. I've lived in London all my life, and I've lived in Ward 10 for 33 years. I am retired from the former Ford plant in Talbotville, and I was a supervisor there. And I feel that my long career at Ford has provided me with the ideal background for being a city councillor. The term team may be something that is overused these days, but when you work in an assembly plant, you're really part of a team. Everyone is interconnected and working together towards a common goal. If something went wrong within the team that I was directly supervising, I had to make things right. If something went wrong anywhere else when, within the assembly line, we're, we're all affected, and further down the line, we had to work together to get our respective sections back on track. If I'm elected to council, I will represent the concerns of Ward 10 and also be part of the team that works together to act in the best interests of the residents of the entire city. The issues we are facing right now aren't just Ward-centric. The issues affect all of us equally, no matter where we live. Thanks, Gary. For Ward 10, Virginia Ridley. Hi, everybody. I'm Virginia Ridley. I'm the current Ward 10 councillor. In 2014, I encouraged you to rethink what you expect of your elected representatives. I made several commitments and I've stood by them. I believe in government officials who are available to the public. I have spent countless hours in living rooms, kitchens, and front porches in War 10 because I believe that's crucial to the role. I've spent the past four years learning about many different roles, including joining city staff to do their jobs. I've been with paramedics when they're assisting Londoners in crisis, police, seeing policing issues firsthand. I've been on snowplow trucks after a storm and swept streets in Ward 10. I've done these because it helps me to understand the role of counselor and what it needs to get done. With me, what you see is what you get. I'm a Londoner who cares about our city and moving our city forward. 
I care about good development and growth and the reputation of our city. I've acted with integrity and I've been thoughtful in my decision making and made sure that the investments we make with your tax dollars are offering a good return on investment in making our city a better place. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. For Ward 9, Anna Hopkins. Yes, I'm Anna Hopkins, and I am the current Ward 9 Councillor, and I want to thank everyone here uh, for participating tonight. I'd like to tell you a little bit about my background and why I'm running for re-election. I've lived in Byron for over 30 years. With my husband, Bill, we raised three boys who went to neighborhood schools, made friends, played on the streets. We ran a small HVAC business for over 25 years and learned the importance of a hard day's work, excellent service, and the challenges facing small businesses were reinforced for me. I've been active as a volunteer and a community, a community advocate for uh, sitting on ver uh, numerous boards throughout the past 30 years as well. I've also been mentoring uh, uh, young women uh, to participate in government the past four years. We only have four out of 15 members on council that are women. It is important uh, that we make sure our daughters know that there is a future for them in public service. I've spent a lifetime getting to know our community, learning the issues and approaches to cre create meaningful change. I've been ready to make a difference Thank in you, our Anna. neighborhoods from day one. Thanks very much. For Ward 10, Paul Van Meerbergen. Thank you and good evening. My name is Paul Van Meerbergen. I've spent the last 24 years in manufacturing and exporting uh, here in London. And let's pray for a NAFTA agreement because we really need it in this part of, of London. Um, there are multiple themes in my platform led by road improvements, uh, traffic flow, and the elimination of the BRT. War 10 residents have been concerned about transportation matters for some years. We need to take a thorough review and near immediate implementation focusing on road congestion, traffic flows, and road maintenance. We need to expedite the Wonderland Road widening, constructing up to six lanes. And we need to complete four lanes on Southdale, west of Wonderland. And of course, Bradley needs to be seamlessly connected right through to Bostwick. But unlike the current Ward 10 rep, a vast majority of Ward 10 residents are saying we need to kill off the BRT. It's a big, expensive, non-essential boondoggle that does not serve the London taxpayer and does not make a whiff of difference in terms of speed of transit in the city. Finally, Ward 10 residents want someone to actually represent what they want and actually deliver on it. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. And for Ward 10, Kevin May. Uh, good evening. My name is Kevin May, and I'm running to represent Ward 10. Uh, I live in Westmount with my wife, Lisa, and our three children. Uh, we decided to live here and raise our family here because of our friendly, welcoming neighbors, uh, available green space, and a family-friendly culture. When I talk to my neighbors and ask them what issues are important to them, it varies. You know, basement floodings caused by uh, sewer overflow, high-speed residential traffic, uh, unsafe street design, the list is long. Each of us have our own opinion on what we feel the key issues are, but the sentiment that many of us share is that our concerns are not being listened to or heard. We can be better. With authentic leadership, with active listening, and genuine straightforward communication, I'm confident that we can achieve a better London. My name's Kevin May, and over the next few hours, in the coming months at your do on your doorsteps, I hope to share my vision on how we can move London and Ward 10 forward together. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, everyone. Let's jump right into the topic portion of the evening. We're going to start with the $500 million elephant in the room. It's the topic everyone wants to hear about, bus rapid transit. This is the largest project in London's history, and it has been extremely controversial for this term of council and will certainly be for the next term of council as well. So the question I have for candidates is, do you support BRT? Why or why not? And if not, do you propose an alternative? We will be starting this time with Veronica Warner for Ward 9. 
Oh, Veronica, you can come up to the podium. Sorry, these, these um, answers will all be given at the podium. Okay, I'm Veronica Warner. I'm running for Ward 9 Council and the BRT. Um, unfortunately, I do not support the BRT. Um, I do believe that London needs a better transit system. Um, I also have asked uh, people from my ward, my clients behind my chair, I mean, it has been a topic that has been quite large in our city, as you know, and a lot of people are confused. They seem to think that it's the LRT, the light rail trail, the light rail train that's gonna be implemented from Toronto to Windsor. So I'm really not sure that Londoners are informed um, to the point where any of us can make a real choice and decision on the BRT. So for that, I have to say that I am against it at this point. Um, if I said I was for it, I'd have a lot of upset um, constituents in the ward. So thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Uh, Kyle Thompson for Ward 9. Okay, BRT. First of all, uh, let's take a look at the uh, proposed rapid transit corridors. And no offense to uh, any of the north, south, or east siders here, but uh, why do you all get a big long one that extends all the way to the edge of the city and us on the west just get a little nub that stops at Wonderland Road? I've got corridor envy over here. The only good thing I could say about the proposed routes as it pertains to my end of the city is that thank God we'll be able to drive our cars unimpeded by the car congestion uh, and the massive construction delays uh, when and if the center line, lane hijacking occurs, unless we decide to go downtown. If you want to see what traffic looks like when the middle of the road is dedicated to mass transit, take a drive down St. Clair Avenue in Toronto. I respond to emergency calls there in a fire truck and we avoid it like the plague uh, in order to maintain a decent response time. Uh, take a look at the ION project in KW that suffered massive delays and went way over budget. Provincial law actually allows um, for businesses affected financially by construction to be reimbursed for their losses under the Expropriations Act. And that's exactly what's happening in Kitchener-Waterloo. They're filing claims by the dozens. When the cases go to arbitration at the Ontario Municipal Board, the city pays the award plus legal costs out of one of their property tax funded accounts. That's your money. Can you think of any businesses along Oxford Street or Richmond Row maybe that might be forced to exercise this right should BRT move forward? I have yet to meet a single person in our ward that supports the rapid transit plan in its current form and very few in the city as a whole. So I guess my question is, why is nobody listening to us? It's pretty insulting that the current council is forging ahead with this plan despite objections from damn near everybody. Thanks. Thank you, Kyle. Matt Miller for Ward 9. I think we can all agree that London has a real transit problem and we need to improve mobility around the city. But the current BRT plan is not the way to do it. The price tag is too high and it's going to cause too much, too much disruption and the end result is going to be of little to no benefit to us. Especially in Ward 9, with the dismal state of public transit, the majority of us need our personal vehicles, and we need a plan that respects that. That being said, there was a lot of time and money that went into the BRT plan, and if we just scrap it entirely, we're going to be losing a lot of money. So we need to salvage some parts of it that can still be useful. Uh, BRT proponents often say that it's the largest road widening project in London's history. That can be a benefit to everyone. Underpasses and overpasses are needed to deal with the train tracks. And I don't know how many times I've driven across town only to be met with red light after red light after red light after red light. So we need to get those lights synchronized properly. So let's do away with the dedicated bus lanes and the bus specific features of the plan, but salvage what we can and make a transit plan that works for everybody. Thank you, Matt. Gary Manley for Ward 10. I'm with these folks. I'm not for the rapid transit system. The majority of London, Londoners are drivers, not riders. BRT will not reduce the number of cars on city streets. I don't feel that people who drive will abandon their cars. 
and take the rapid bus across the city just because the rapid bus exists. The long BRT construction phase will also be a detriment to the downtown core. If it's too difficult to get around downtown, people won't frequent the core and business will suffer. In the past few years, the LTC has expanded bus routes and extended hours of service on certain routes. If it's still felt that the current routes and schedules aren't adequate enough, we can further improve upon them. We won't leave LTC riders behind. If BRT doesn't go through, we can continue to conduct ridership surveys to ensure that the needs of those of us, the bus are being, <laughs> the needs of those who use the bus are being listened to and tended to. There are a number of ideas from the city's Smart Moves 2030 Transportation Master Plan that can be part of the revised proposal on how London can use the federal and provincial transportation infrastructure funds if we decide not to pursue BRT. We can improve LTC trip times by implementing more transit priority lights, maybe more dedicated bus lines and adding more buses to the fleet, and by having more express buses along the heavily traveled routes. Traffic can be improved by the implementation of intelligent transportation systems for traffic lights. The system will adjust signals based on real-time traffic information, better synchronization of singles, signals, and signals that change more frequently based upon the need will result in less back, backlog on Ontario roads. These changes would also help the environment, benefiting that the uh, cars are shorter, uh, shorter idling times at lights. We can also create more protected bike lanes that protect the, <laughs> the protected lanes would be developed in consultation with cyclists so the lanes meet the needs of those who use them. Climate change has resulted in a longer cycling season, so it would be ideal to encourage more Londoners to take up this form of transportation okay. if a secure network of paths and lanes existed for them to do. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> Virginia Ridley for War 10. I'm absorbing what I've heard, and I've heard these same comments in the community. In every opportunity that I've had, I have taken to explain to people what BRT is about. And I have some notes here, but before I even go into them, I'm going to tell you that BRT is not just about buses. BRT is about jobs, it's about infrastructure, it's about saving you money. That's what BRT is about. We are looking at $250 million of infrastructure that if we don't do BRT, we will be doing. We will have the construction disruption, we will have the road widenings, and you'll be paying that on your property taxes over the next 20 years. BRT means that your dollar, for every dollar invested in transit and in construction, you're only paying 24 cents of it through your property taxes. Yes, you are the taxpayer at the provincial and federal level. I'm not going to argue that, and that's the exact thing that people will say back to me. But this money is going into transit projects across the country. And why not here? And why not invest in our streets here? And why not make the changes here? And I don't think I'm going to convince you or you or you to give up your car. I'm not. But there's younger people here, and we need to change the way we grow as a city. We are invested in the London plan. We've adopted it as our official plan, which means that we're going to have higher density growth. No longer are we going to have the sprawl that we've done for the past 30 years that's costing us in our fire services, in our police services, in our snow removal services. We are going to look at dense building. And dense building means that you need better transit. You need to move people quicker. And we're not laying this on top of the LTC plan as is. We need to rework all of that and have a better transit plan for everyone. That includes cyclists, includes pedestrians, and includes transit users and vehicle users. This is about the long-term vision of our city and how we grow. In the next 30 years, we will grow by almost 25%. And I think it's going to be more than that. When you see the fact that you, we have people migrating here from cities like Toronto, you look at things like high-speed rail coming in from Toronto, I think our growth is going to be exponential, and we need a system that is going to keep up with that. I don't think I have time to read what I wrote, but I'll give you the last Virginia, point. I'm sorry. That is your time. Thank you. For Ward 9, Anna Hopkins. Thank you. I think we can all agree here 
this evening, all of us, regardless if you support BRT or not, that we need to improve the way we move around our city. Council has always been open to a better plan. So if there's a better plan out there, please let us know. We have a transportation plan that has to be implemented to improve the way we move our city. That's the plan that we have right before us. Last night at Council, we approved the Adelaide underpass. It's going to be starting in a couple years. It's being brought forward. That is one part of the transportation plan. I think it's going to be quite exciting to be able to move north and south along the corridor. Another layer of this transportation plan is the BRT. The BRT is about widening the roads and taking advantage of provincial and federal funding. Instead of Londoners paying $1 for every infrastructure cost, you're paying 24 cents. We're just coming to the end of our environmental assessment, and so far, the BRT has been the best plan. If there's another plan, I'm open to it. We need to improve transit, reduce traffic, and costs associated with urban sprawl. It's what Ward 9 is all about. I'm open to hearing the community's ideas on how we can improve upon the current plan. We have the London plan, which I'm pretty sure we're all familiar with. It's about building our city in and out, supporting transit. Intensification, 45% downtown. You're saying no to the BRT. You're saying no to $320 million of work property that the taxpayer will have to pay. Traffic signalization program that will be implemented as part of that BRT. More roads will have to be built, and we will have an ineffective system that leaves people frustrated. Thank you, Anna. I'm sorry, that is your time. For War 10, Paul Van Meerbergen. Thank you. Uh, as stated in my opening remarks, um, I am against the uh, BRT, uh, as are a vast majority of the residents of the City of London and, of course, Ward 10. Um, Ward 10 is nowhere near uh, where the BRT is planned to be built. Um, the fact of the matter is we have a city which has been underserved for decades with our road system. We are a major city. We're not a village. Um, this idea that everybody's going to magically leave their cars and jump onto a bus um, with this plan is absolutely not going to happen. And what we're seeing with this plan is reductions and restrictions in the um, limited amount of car space that we do have on our roads. And if you just want to see an example of that, you just have to go to Kitchener-Waterloo, which I think it was mentioned a little earlier. Um, one time I had the misfortune of getting behind next to an LRT rail the road down to one lane, stuck behind a garbage truck, and if you want the definition of grief, that's it. And that's what's going to be coming to London um, if we don't take the corrective actions necessary. The people of London are speaking, the people of London have spoken, they'll continue to speak. Uh, this plan is not for them. They want a proper transportation plan. That's not to say that we don't need an LTC. Um, bus transit is uh, an important secondary system, it's not the primary system. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Kevin May for Board 10. Okay, so I have a bit of a unique perspective, I think, from the other uh, candidates up here. I am a public daily, uh, I'm a daily uh, public transit user. Um, I spend two hours on a bus every day to and from work. I'm all too familiar with the challenges we face with the LTC right now. What we need is, I, I believe this system is the route to go. It's a system we have, and we need to provide ourselves real options on not only deciding where we want to go, but how we want to get there. A strong transit system in London means students are less likely to leave each year, businesses are more likely to build here, less environmental impact, and less congestion, preventing the need to widen Wonderland Road to six lanes, which I feel will be devastating to my ward. While many will choose to focus on the negatives of this plan, I choose to look at the positives. 
BRT will increase reliability on our busiest routes by 35 percent. This is the lowest costing plan rapid transit plan in Canada. It takes advantage of available funds from provincial and federal governments. That's money that Londoners have already paid. That needs to come back into our community. It will also increase the areas not served by the BRT. Those buses that are currently running along those lanes are going to go elsewhere and they'll be able to serve the industrial area. They'll be able to serve Ward 10 and other areas that are currently in need of that support. The BRT will save London millions of dollars in scheduled road resurfacing costs or widening costs. That's again, that's coming straight out of our pockets. We need to take advantage of those dollars. This plan is simply not just for transit users. This plan will help ease congestion and traffic on our busiest streets, meaning less time stuck in rush hour traffic and less cars cutting through our residential areas to avoid that traffic. While I support the BRT plan, I do believe there are questions that need to be answered. However, we cannot throw out the decades of study, the consultations, just because the plan is not perfect right now. We cannot simply ignore the money that's already spent and invested in this project. We must stop fighting amongst ourselves and move forward together to make this plan implemented with all perspectives considered. Thanks, Thank Kevin. You. Thank you. Ben Charlebois for Ward 9. So this is one area where I think London definitely needs to think bigger. Uh, as we can see from the people who have come before me, most of them, um, it's a lot easier to tear something down than it is to build it up. The reality is that BRT is an infrastructure plan and it is providing a lot of you know, road work and infrastructure that we will need at one point and right now we have an opportunity to have the province and the federal government pay for more than two thirds of it. So in my opinion, BRT is a step in the right direction. Uh, I think the city needs to take responsibility for its future and in this future, we will have to, the future is now, we will have to compete with Kitchener-Waterloo and with Hamilton for both talent and for business. And we're, we're going to have to do that by being a livable, modern, forward-thinking city. Uh, so I support the current plan, especially if we're able to electrify it. I think that would be fantastic. But I am frustrated by two things. I'm frustrated by delays and by poor communication. So this council and the mayor were elected with a mandate to modernize transit. And what bothers me about that is that after an entire mandate, after four years, most of that which was spent with a pro-transit province and a pro-transit federal government, we have no shovels in the ground. Initially, the city put forth the hybrid plan and then they went towards BRT and then they took out the Richmond Tunnel and all the while, when they submitted their proposals for funding, they left money on the table. I think they really missed out on an opportunity to provide some of the transformative change that voters were asking for when they elected so many pro-transit, pro-rapid transit councillors. But the past is the past. BRT, in my opinion, is a reasonable plan to upgrade transit and whenever we're building for the future, we're going to have to be able to stomach some construction. That is going to happen regardless. Why not now? The city has done a terrible job of selling what is otherwise a solid BRT plan, in my opinion. In War 9 in particular, BRT won't connect to our ward, but it will cause existing routes to be realigned and it will free resources to expand services into Lambeth and Byron. I'd like to make sure that the city is looking westward when they plan for this shift in resources. Okay. Thanks, Kyle. Two minutes is not a lot of time to talk about BRT. I'm sure we'll come back to it later and it may even come up in, in the next question, but we do need to move on, so let's move on with it. Uh, the question I have is regarding tax rates. Nobody likes paying taxes, but as we all know, they are very important dollars. They fund things like local school boards, fire and police services, transportation, and our parks. The current overall 2018 residential tax rate is 1.350819%, roughly. Um, so, question to candidates, what do you think of our current tax rates? Should they increase or decrease? And if so, how would you make up the difference or spend the additional funds? And we will be starting this time with Kyle Thompson for Ward 9. Well, it might come as a shock to you, but again, uh, I'm no expert here. Uh, but 
from what I gather from people in the community is that uh, none of us really minds paying tax, provided that our tax money goes to where it has actually been allocated. We pay much higher property taxes here in London than our friends uh, a couple of hours down the street, but I believe that we have a far superior standard of living here. I look at my own property tax bill, and I see I spent uh, $110 on having my garbage taken away last year. That sounds pretty reasonable to me. Uh, I spent roughly $1,000 uh, for police and fire, and I'm a little bit biased here, but uh, $2.75 seems like a pretty, uh, pretty inexpensive insurance policy to protect my family. $130 for parks and recreation, I've got no beef with that. But when you take away something, like a free wading pool, and replace it with something that's pay per use, like what's happening at Jorgensen Park in Byron, that's where I take issue. We're taxed incredibly high here, and that's fine. But don't try to charge us for something that we're already paying good money for. It reminds me of the conservation area uh, on the way to Kilworth that you now have to pay to park at. And that's provincial, but, uh, but where does it end? We pay enough in taxes that we shouldn't have to be paying to get into our parks, our wading pools, our splash pads. I paid $450 last year for transportation services. 255 of that was for roadways, and uh, $195 went to the LTC. This means that the LTC is nowhere close to being self-sufficient with its current fare-paying ridership. Is spending another $500 million minimum going to increase ridership to the levels where transit can finally stand on its own? There's no chance. I'd rather see my infrastructure money go to long overdue projects like widening Southdale and Colonel Talbot roads and commissioners uh, and simply adding more bus routes and buses to, uh, to encourage ridership and make the service more accessible. Thanks. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> Sorry, that was Kyle. <laughs> Thank you, Kyle. Matt Miller for Ward 9. Well, I don't have a lot to say on this. Um, definitely not in favor of raising taxes. Canadians are overtaxed as it is. The average Canadian pays over 40% of their income to taxes, and I don't want to be responsible for increasing that. So I think we can take a look at the budget and see if there's any ways that we can reallocate funds, look at what we're spending money on, and I would take a pay cut rather than increase taxes. Thank you, Matt. Gary Manley for War 10. I have a short story also. I think it's feasible to maintain the current tax rates for going BRT will help as no tax increase will be needed to fund the city's share of the expense. The new 4% hotel tax will also provide some funds for the to-be-determined tourism and entertainment projects. If the Western Fair District and the city allow Gateway Casinos to go ahead with its planned expansion, the city's share of the host site, reve host site revenue will increase also, providing the city with more funding and also 700 jobs. In the light of all these options, I don't feel taxes will need to be increased in the immediate future. That's it. Thank you, Gary. Uh, for Word 10 also, Virginia Ridley. Thanks, Christine. I'm going to read from my paper this time because I missed some stuff last time. Uh, so during the 2014 to 2018 term of council, we had the opportunity to review budgets and get into the multi-year budgeting. We were able to reduce our debt by 10%, and we all know that debt long term ends up costing us more money and more increases down the road. We've increased the reserves to close that infrastructure gap uh, and pay for lifestyle maintenance of infrastructure. And sorry, when I say close, it's not all the way closed. We have more work to do. Um, and council has been doing it and will continue to do it. If I'm on council, I will continue to support looking at the budget line by line, making hard decisions and tough decisions, but making sure that we're covering off the services that are important to Londoners. I supported the multi-year budget and I would continue to support it because of the stability that it provides. It provides stability in terms of funding the services and the rates that taxpayers know to expect. With that being said, even with what we set, we brought it down. Uh, we built in service review targets that force staff to find efficiencies and make cuts. I continue to support taking hard looks at budgets, absolutely, line by line, making sure, but we can't say no to everything today and delay doing work because the work comes due and it's always more expensive. 
So that is my stance on tax rates. I think that taking a look at it and being very fiscally responsible, conservative, cautious, but making investments that give that return are important. Thank you, Virginia. For Ward 9, Anna Hopkins. Thank you, Christine. When I became a counselor, I became a steward of your money. And I have taken that responsibility very seriously. I'm very frugal when it comes to spending your money. It was mentioned that uh, the waiting pool at uh, Jorgensen Park is being taken away from the community, and the community is quite upset about that. And they're looking for a splash pad costing $400,000. And I went to staff and said, you know, this is important to the community. We're having something taken away that is very valued and is used. And there's no money in the budget. So what I've proposed to do is work with staff to see if we can get some um, um, availability for young people to use this splash pad feature when they are uh, at the pool. I think it's those creative things, those other things that we can do uh, to see if there's other opportunities. It's not always about asking the money because there's usually a price to pay for that. And if it's not allocated in the budget, it's difficult to come up with it. We're a billion dollar corporation and this council, for the first time, developed a four year budget. That means that you have known for four years what your tax rate is going to look like. It's been between 2.8, 2.9, taking in residential, commercial, and industrial taxes. We know inflation has been about around 1.2, 1.3, so we've kept them very low. We also did reduce our debt. Throughout the year, throughout this four-year budget, we do review it line by line. And, uh, I think it's really important that uh, staff have been giving us updates so we know exactly where we are with, within our budget. Having a small business and running a household, I know how important it is to have some predictability when it comes to budgeting. I like the new system. I hope the next council will implement another four-year budget. It works with the strategic plan that the next council will also develop. Thanks, Thank Anna. You. For War 10, Paul Van Meerbergen. Thank you. Uh, we just have to look at uh, the history of taxation in our city to know that we are being overtaxed. Um, it's very important that we stay competitive with those communities that we compete with. And quite often with the, uh, the taxation situation, uh, we find ourselves not on the competitive edge uh, in our ability to attract new businesses, new investment. You only have to look between the year 2000 and 2010, taxes went up by 50%. That's a 5-0% increase. The last four years on this particular council, uh, it's gone up by over 12% with compounding uh, in those four years. Now, who has had a wage increase of that amount? This is coming out of our collective disposable income, and that puts a dampener on economic activity and it makes it harder, especially for the burgeoning uh, senior population in our city to, to hang on to that family home. What I say is we have to prioritize spending. You can't put your hand up on council and vote for every little spending request. It just can't be. I hear things like there's no money for splash pads, yet we can find a half billion dollars for a BRT nobody wants. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Kevin May for Ward 10. So, as a family, yeah, father of the young family, I, I know all too well how much we live in a world where every dollar matters. The reality is true costs are rising, whether it's environmental impact, costs of materials, currency rates, many factors have led to London having one of the highest tax rates in comparable cities in Canada. But the question is not just how much we're being taxed is where, what value are we getting for our hard-earned dollars? By law, municipalities have to budget for a surplus every year. That's prudent policy. But the surpluses that we run are currently higher than what we spend on house, uh, housing, uh, social housing and health. 
We're averaging around $150 million in surplus to nearly $4 billion in accumulated surplus right now that we're sitting on. Um, now I believe there is room to not only lower taxes but also to increase new projects that address poverty, impress affordable housing and improve accessibility while doing so. And how we do that is we invest in capital, we make capital investments in programs that will save us in operating costs in the future. If we don't fix our leaky roofs now, what are we going to do when they cave in? How much will that cost us? We also need to grow inward and upward instead of urban sprawl so we don't need, we can build communities and we don't, um, we can add more taxpayers without attaining more valuable farmland. A true commitment to waste reduction will help save us landfill expansion costs in the future. And investing in transit at 130 million, which is the cost to the City of London, is the 130, not the 500. The rest of that money is already spent. Um, we'll add pro in adding protected bike lanes for all ages, well maintained and accessible sidewalks. We'll ease the congestion to lower resurfacing and widening costs that continue to grow. All these are possible uh, working with the federal and provincial governments to ensure that London has shovel ready projects when funds do become available and will mean more money that Londoners are paying comes back into our community. We will start moving London forward in a fiscally and socially responsible way. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Ben Charlebois for Board 9. So um, I, ju I just want to start by, by correcting something that I, that I overheard uh, from another, another candidate here. Um, or rather not a correction but a clarification. So most transit systems in Ontario are not self-sufficient. They get a subsidy from the taxpayers. And London actually has one of the smallest subsidies of any city uh, in Ontario. Uh, definitely smaller than all of the other cities of similar sizes. So, uh, so the idea that you know LTC should be paying for itself isn't really realistic if we want to be a competitive city moving forward. Um, so uh, other than that, I will agree with Kyle that most of what I hear about taxes is not that they're too high, um, but that people want to make sure that they're being spent properly. Part of, uh, part of fiscal responsibility, the main part of fiscal responsibility is actually paying for the things that we want. So if we want to be able to invest in things for the long-term benefit, we need to be able to pay for them. And in my opinion, council needs to do a better job of showing people where their money goes. And equally importantly, showing them why it's worth it. And that's where it comes down to having a vision and having a bigger picture. And not only coming up with the, the London plan, which is great, if you haven't read it, it's a 280 something page document, but actually sticking to the London plan and making sure that people understand that this is what we're spending our money on. I think London has a fair tax rate for the things that we get. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think there's any urgent need to, to raise taxes or to lower taxes. Uh, and I think people are content to pay it when they can understand the bigger picture. Uh, so we need to show them that bigger picture and we need to come up with a clear vision that depicts a city in the future better than it is today so that when they see that tax bill they understand where it's going. Thanks, Ben. Veronica Warner for Ward 9. I'm not very experienced with um, the taxes in London and how we pay our taxes, how much tax is going to be going here, going there. Um, what I do know as a small business owner for the last 20 years is that my taxes keep going up, which is fine. You know, I, I do see improvements in our city, but I have to say we can do better. You know, this year I was. Um, along with every other small business in this city. My license happened to double in price. You know, they gave me a four month extension to pay, but it actually doubled. Um, and that was for every single small business in London. And we wondered where that money went. Where, why, why did we have to pay double our license fees? What are, what are we getting for this as a small business? Well, the answers weren't readily available. So the big reason why I decided to run for council this year and represent our city is the child poverty rate. We have the third highest child poverty rate in Canada for a city of our size. Our children are not getting fed in our schools. 
We are offering breakfast programs at this point, but it's not enough. And if we don't take care of these children and make sure that they have bellies that are full instead of sitting in their classrooms with their stomachs grumbling and insecurities, they're gonna become drug addicts, alcoholics. They're not gonna be our future. We need to take care of our future. So if my taxes have to go up five or $10 a month, to feed the children of London, I can be proud of that. I love London, and I want to see our future bright. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, let's jump into another controversial topic. In February of this year, the Middlesex London Health Unit opened London's first temporary overdose protection site, where drug users can inject illegal substances under the supervision of a medical per professional. They are currently making plans for at least one permanent safe injection site, which would serve the same purpose. So the question to candidates is, how do you feel about the presence of these types of safe consumption sites in London? And we'll be starting this time with Matt Miller for Ward 9. So when I first heard about uh, supervised consumption sites, I probably had the same knee-jerk reaction as most of you. Why should we be facilitating illegal activities by helping people get high? But when you take a step back and look at it, there are some benefits. Because let's face it, people are going to be doing drugs regardless of whether we have these sites or not. At least with the supervised sites, we can keep needles and other dangerous objects away from kids. We may even save some lives but we should really be focusing on getting help for the users. We don't want to just enable them, but set them on the path to getting clean. The other big issue is the location. Nobody wants to have one of these sites next to their home, especially since they tend to bring an increase in crime to the area. I was speaking with a mayoral candidate, and he has an idea for mobile sites so that they can be easily relocated to the areas where they're needed most, and it prevents uh, area from permanently being affected. And that's an idea that I would, could get behind. And I also want to make it clear that I don't see any need for a supervised consumption site in Ward 9. So as things stand, I would be against having one in our area. Thank you, Matt. Gary Manley for Ward 10. London has a drug problem. Ignoring our own residents who are affected by drug addiction is even a bigger problem. Regardless of how they got there, we need to pro provide a support system for anyone who is suffering from addiction. Safe injection sites provide a support system for anyone, oh, excuse me, safe injection sites give people access to sterile supplies and provide a place for safe disposal of needles so there will be less on our streets. Most importantly, they provide emergency assistance to individuals if they require this. Staff at the safe injection sites can also give individuals the information they need to get on a path to end addiction if they choose this. London needs permanent safe injection sites. Also, I feel it's important to implement a drug education program for our city's young people. The program would be devote, developed in conjunction with the Middlesex London Health Center and with other frontline staff at agencies who deal with people who are affected by drug addiction. A proactive approach to informing young people of the effects of engaging in substance abuse will hopefully go a long way towards helping to reduce the number of individuals who become addicted in the future. Thank you, Gary. For Ward 10, Virginia Ridley. Thank you. I think it's safe to say that most people in this room, in Ward 10, or in London, have been affected by addictions. We all have a loved one, or a friend, or a friend of a friend, or someone in our life who has experienced some kind of addiction. Through my work with social services and my understanding of people, I believe that harm reduction is the best model. I am a supporter of supervised consumption facilities, I believe that we need to take care of all people in our society, that all life has value, no matter what the struggles are. Supervised consumption facilities have saved lives. Dozens of lives already in our city have been saved. We know that for a fact there are people who are alive today because of them. By creating a space where people feel safe and cared for, where they can 
be protected and have the uh, instruments available that they require that can be disposed of appropriately. We also create a space where people feel safe to go when they're ready to make a change. If you've ever known anyone with addictions, you will know that change happens when that person is ready. ready. Regardless of how much we love them and how hard we try, change is intrinsic and it takes that person being ready to take the step. And so supervised consumption facilities is about creating a safety net and creating a space and making those services available to Londoners who need them most when they need them most. Thank you, Virginia. For Ward 9, Anna Hopkins. Thank you again. If I may, I'd just like to make a slight correction. Uh, it, was, uh, it was suggested uh, that uh, mobile sites would be an alternative. And I do know that without a safe injection site in London, we cannot have a mobile site. So I just would like to pass that information on. I think in London we have an opioid crisis, without a doubt. I'm sure, like uh, Virginia said, we all have a family member or a friend who has suffered from addiction. We have the same problems that large cities like Toronto and Vancouver and Ottawa have. And yet we're a city of under 400,000 people. What we have done in the past has not worked. People are dying in our streets. Families are being torn apart. Our parks where our children play are littered with needles. We know the temporary site that we have on King Street is working. 1,500 people have used that service since February. Six overdoses have been reversed. 90 people have been referred to other services for treatment and housing and counseling. Safe site is about partnerships with the police, EMS, a nurse is there. There's support. Some safe injection sites, some people see safe injection sites as a place that helps people do drugs. I think it is a place where we help people get better. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Paul Van Meerbergen for Ward 10. Thank you. Uh, this, this issue does require uh, compassion, um, certainly from our community. Um, safe injection sites are a critical public health issue. Proper medical attention for those afflicted with addictions will certainly help ensure the safety of all of us. Um, and we have to also recognize that it, it has to be done in concert with uh, the province, because ultimately it's the province that has jurisdiction over health care, and this requires um, a multi-pronged approach over and above just safe injection sites. So we even look to our own medical community, the medical community across Canada and indeed North America. Um, there's a recognition that uh, prescriptions of opioids have to come down and it must be far uh, more restricted than it was in the past. Uh, because people that are on painkillers given by their physician and then ultimately end up in these uh, horrible situations has to come to an end and, and we, the medical community I think re responded to that and uh, has taken action in kind. So again, I would suggest that um, it has to be done in concert with the province. The primary function at the municipal level is to make sure that we check very carefully before we approve uh, where a safe injection site is located and that, that is ultimately key. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Also for War 10, Kevin May. Well, it's, uh, it's true, safe injection uh, consumption sites uh, have been a polarizing issue uh, with very strong opinions on both sides, whether it's a question of location, cost, safety, uh, some of it's misinformation, some of it's stereotypes. Uh, there are still many conversations to be had, um, but I think we can all agree that we want a safer, healthier community. And if we can all agree on that, then London absolutely needs safe consumption sites. In the, some of the numbers were already said, but in the first six month trial, uh, over 1,500 people went through, uh, over 4,500 safe, uh, supervised safe injections were overseen, 
Um, around 100 people were, um, got support through programs that were readily available and um, six overdoses were reversed and that's actually doubled um, in the last few weeks. Uh, we currently are in the middle of an opioid crisis. Uh, last year, over a million used needles were recovered in London. Instead of pushing our drug use to parks and public spaces, we need to support those in the community that are, choose to seek help. I will work with the province to move forward on a selecting a permanent location for stability and acceptance that is in an area that has flexibility to accommodate additional wraparound services such as counseling and rehabilitation to give people the best opportunity to succeed. Safe consumption sites are helping remove used needles from our parks and public spaces, keeping our community safe. They're helping those that are seeking treatment and most importantly, they are saving lives. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. For Ward 9, Ben Charlebois. So I'm going to shock you and be the seventh straight candidate to endorse safe injection sites. Um, but I'm going to take it a step further because I believe that as councillors, I believe that our, our local political leaders have an obligation to explain when these controversial issues come up and how they fit into uh, a broader vision for the city and, uh, and to advocate across levels of government. So it's absolutely obvious that we're in the midst of an epidemic. There are thousands of Canadians dying every year from, uh, from opioid overdose. And we need to tackle the cause of this problem. Um, but there's more to be done, so, so we, need, we need to talk uh, to tackle the cause of this, pro uh, this problem, and a discussion needs to happen on things like housing and mental health services. But we also need to be absolutely clear about how to treat the, those problems, uh, those symptoms. And that, that means uh, admitting that prohibition and punishment is failing. So I've spoken to Londoners who are afraid to go for hikes uh, because needles are discarded in parks and forests. And I think everyone can agree that forcing addicts into hiding helps nobody. Harm reduction is, is the way to go. <laughs> um, harm reduction is something that London needs to fully embrace, and I'm, I'm heartened to know that most of the existing council have embraced that. But it's absolutely unconscionable that the provincial government would put safe injection sites on hold when everyone recognizes that we are in a crisis right now. Uh, the first three weeks of August, um, there were, there were numerous overdo overdoses prevented uh, at, a, at the single safe injection site in London. That means lives saved. And that's not just the right thing to do, it's the practical thing to do. Because when we prevent ODs, when we prevent infections, when we stop the transmission of disease, that frees up ambulances, that frees up hospital beds, that frees up frontline healthcare workers, and that saves us uh, precious healthcare dollars. So I believe that it's not only our obligation to support this and to explain it, but to advocate to the provincial and federal governments uh, that London absolutely needs this practical and compassionate um, program to continue. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> Veronica Warner for Ward 9. My name is Veronica Warner, and um, yeah, I believe that um, this issue is more important than our BRT and moving people around the city. This city has never had a treatment facility rehab center for the people. The city used to have 20 years ago a detox facility that was run by the St. Joe's Healthcare, which was located on the corner of, I believe, King and Clarence, not Clarence. Anyway, it was there 20 years ago. And you know, it did wonderful things. There were a lot of people that went through that center and they were referred off to Westover Treatment Facility and many of them did become clean and sober and today are still living productive lives as a result. We need a treatment rehab facility in this city that will accommodate all addictions, not just this one, not just that one. We have alcoholics, we have methadone people, we have crackheads, you name it, the list is long. Vanish point syringes, have you heard of them? Vanish point syringes will help reduce HIV and AIDS among the many diseases 
that dirty needles cause. A vanish point syringe is a one-time use needle. So when it is injected into the user's skin, it is then retracted back in, never to be used again. Will it cost us a bit of money? Sure it will. But it will get the dirty needles out of our parks, perhaps. It's just an idea. I'm very passionate about this. Um, and I believe this should come first before BRT. Thanks. Thank you, Veronica. Kyle Thompson for Ward 9. Well, I might be able to provide a bit of a different perspective than some of the other candidates. Uh, my career as a first responder, I deal with heroin and fentanyl overdoses on a regular basis. A couple of weeks ago, we had uh, seven fatal overdoses in two days as a result of a bad batch on the street. And this is where I put my serious face on. I've treated homeless teenagers in alleyways and resuscitated 30-year-old mothers in nice homes while their young children look on. It's no longer a problem confined to those living below the, living below the poverty line in our big cities. It's in the suburbs. It's in Ward 9. Unfortunately, the idea of a safe consumption site is your classic not-in-my-backyard issue. A lot of people would like to see them in or near the hospitals. However, knowing what I know about heroin and opiate addiction, it's, a, it's not a part-time job. Opiates soothe you, and then they break you in half when you don't have them. You get violently ill when you go through withdrawal, and I'm not sure spending time and money on a cab ride or a bus to one of these sites is a high priority when the drugs that will make you not feel sick, again, are already in your pocket. <laughs> Studies have shown that IV drug users will travel up to one kilometer to use at a supervised site, so I'm not sure how we're going to roll this out. Obviously, we need to keep our most vulnerable people safe. We also have to keep our children and our playgrounds clean. So yes, I support safe injection sites in theory, but we better do our homework when we're rolling this out because it can't be a knee-jerk issue to roll out in the name of being progressive. There are real dangers associated with putting them in our communities, and there is a real danger in sitting on our ass and pretending that we don't have a problem. So let's do it right. Thank you, Kyle. Well, we're just over an hour in, and we've been doing some really hard work on some really controversial issues. We're going to change gears now and lighten it up a little bit with a, a question that's a little bit more optimistic, I suppose, uh, about the future of our community. If you ask any Londoner about their hopes and dreams for the city, vibrant community, arts and culture, uh, a place that people want to call home is going to be top of the list. But if you ask them how we get there, the answers may differ. So the question for candidates is, what do you think the role of council should be when it comes to promoting arts and community vitality in London? We'll be starting this time with Gary Manley for Ward 10. London has a strong arts community. We have more people, particularly new graduates, who are working in some aspect of the arts and who are choosing to remain in London due to the support these individuals receive from their peers and from London residents at large. London also has a number of distinct communities, such as Old South, Old East Village, and the Argyle community, to name just a few, that have residents who are very engaged within their own neighborhoods through a variety of programming initiatives. It is important that Council show its support for the arts and for any event that promotes the sense of community. By having councillors attend these events and by providing funding through the city's various grant programs. In addition, arts and community events don't just benefit our own residents, but they also help to bring increased revenue to the city by way of the number of visitors who come to London to attend these events. I make my story short. Thank you, Gary. For Ward 10, Virginia Ridley. Thank you. I believe that people want to live in a place where they enjoy the amenities, where they access libraries, arenas, sporting facilities, museums, parks, pools, and sometimes all of the above. A great city is about more than just roads and water. It's about quality of life. The quality of living is important to Londoners, and having a city that provides high-quality arts and entertainment 
not only for the citizens, but also promoting visitors and tourism is important to the sustainability and enjoyment of our city. This term, I've sat on Museum London's Board of Directors. I've supported many arts and recreation program and attended many of the events. I believe that City Council does need to make decisions, but the decisions have to balance all the needs of the community, the social, the recreational, the arts, the culture, the transportation, and the infrastructure. We need to continually look at finding the right mix in making sure that our city is one that people want to stay in and enjoy themselves. Thank you, Virginia. Anna Hopkins for Ward 9. Uh, thank you for the question. I, I do think the question should be how council should do it and what is the best way to accomplish these goals. So first of all, I'm proud that uh, council partnered with community groups celebrating Canada's 150 last year, uh, including arts that celebrate Canada's history and heritage as well. There was a lot of work going on. An interesting thing uh, that we have done right in Byron is implementing the Storybook Garden Master Plan, including new programming for kids, which includes arts programming by Fanshawe Theatre Arts. The annual Doors Open is happening next month, and that's an example how the city and the London Arts Council implement arts programs together. If I was re-elected, one small investment I think we can make in the arts is doing more on council to allow for community groups to use public spaces as canvas for murals in London. I've been approached by residents in Byron. They say, you know that blank brick wall over there? It needs to be brightened up. We'll make our streetscape come alive. One of the concerns I've had while working with a veterans group the past couple years wanting to put a monument in Springbank Park has been the process that we have at Council. It's very cumbersome, and in fact, it's very convoluted. I think maybe we can cut some of that red tape, as well as the costs. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Paul Van Meerbergen for Ward 10. Thank you. Um, I think we all recognize that uh, we are blessed uh, in the City of London to have a very dynamic arts community, um, a thriving arts community, and we should all be very uh, thankful and proud of that. It's something we should celebrate. Uh, the fact is, the local government plays a role, of course, in promoting, uh, perhaps coordinating, but the idea that um, to have arts thrive is reliant on tax money is, is wrong. It comes from each and one of us. It comes from within. Uh, it doesn't come from government. Now, that's not to say that uh, at the local level, we can't assist uh, on the odd uh, project and to, to help, but we have to resist the temptation that it requires continual and a majority of tax money to have a thriving arts community. It's not the case, and you just have to look at London as an example. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Kevin May for Ward 10. All right. Well, um, first of all, I, I, I mean, if you, if you want to get a true idea of the um, cultural and artistic abilities that come out of London, uh, before you leave tonight, take a look at the walls that were um, along the, the side here. As mentioned earlier, a lot of local artists, a lot of cultural uh, representation. Um, our arts community does promote expression, culture, and has proven to reflect our identity as a community. Uh, an example was when the uh, controversy, when our school board's decision to cut the funding for the production prom date. Um, we saw the community come together and donate their hard-earned money so the show could go on. London is passionate about arts and expression, and it is important that we view our arts not only for the cultural benefits, but also for the eco economical impact that it drives. Whether it's our museums, the Grand Theatre, our many festivals, London's art scene increases tourism revenue, and with the addition of the hotel tax, that will only have a greater impact. We also need to support small businesses, like for instance in our, um, my writing of War 10, For the Love of Art, which is a small business that showcases local talent, promotes 
art, creativity, and while running a successful small business that contributes to our community. We currently spend about 4% of revenue on arts and culture, but we fail to utilize other assets that can be used to show, showcase our local talent. As Councillor Hopkins said already, our libraries, our community centers, our other public spaces can be used to promote our young talent and spread the message that artists can be supported here at home, that they can move forward here, and that they don't need to leave for other cities to succeed. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Ben Charlebois for Ward 9. So I, I do believe that there's a role for government to play in, um, in you know, the, cultural, um, the cultural vitality of the city. Uh, and I would just look for brief examples to Tourism London and the, the terrific job they've done in the last few years uh, attracting the Country Music Awards, uh, the Junos um, coordinating Trackside and Sesquifest. And Paul's right in that it comes down to all of us to get out and actually appreciate and take in the things that are available to us. And there's a ton available to us. There's a thriving art scene and there's a very quickly growing uh, music scene in London. But I do believe that the government has an important role to play in coordinating that and, um, and in helping to promote it. Uh, I, I think that if we give our own artists, if we give our musicians an advantage, if we make it easier for them to get in front of Londoners, that that adds a certain, uh, a certain amount of, uh, of prestige and that adds, um, that adds credibility that, that they're looking for when they're trying to compete with artists and musicians from Windsor, Sarnia, Kitchener, Waterloo, Toronto, et cetera. Uh, so I think that there's a, a role for government to play in that. Um, I would also like to double down on the London Music Office. For those of you don't, who don't know, the London Music Office is right now an office of one. Uh, they, they did some, uh, some, some good advocacy work most recently in allowing, uh, in, in overturning the, the years old bylaw uh, banning live music on patios, which I think is something that's really important if we're going to attract people to downtown and create the impression that this is a city that young people can thrive in and will want to thrive in and stay in after, after they're done at Fanshawe and uh, Western. Um, the other thing that I would focus on is so Byron and Lambeth are both very unique communities, and I think it's a shame that they didn't become business improvement areas like Old South and like downtown and Old East Village. I think that's something that, that they desperately need. I think the businesses in those communities, and I would do this on my day one as councillor, I would knock on those doors and say, we need to come together, we need to start coordinating so that we can make sure that the city plan includes us and so that we can turn these places into, um, into attractions, into places that people will come from across London to see. Uh, whether it's Main Street in Lambeth or, or Byron, both of those things have a lot of character that they can offer. And I think it's important that the city uh, takes an active role in, um, in promoting that. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> Veronica Warner for Ward 9. Okay, well, um, Lambeth and Byron are villages. And they are full of vibrant, unique shops and generations of businesses that have gone on like Miller's Berry Farm for three generations who we have all suffered from all the lengthy unorganized construction. Last year was my year that I suffered and I know what it's like to rob Peter to pay Paul and not take a summer vacation because you want to hang on to the one thing that makes you happy and that's serving the public and that's my passion. In Byron, we have Springbank Park. It's vibrant, full of all different ethnic cultures on the weekend. There is um, uh, Art in the Park, where all the local artists get together on a Sunday, a Saturday and a Sunday morning. And it's beautiful, and everybody comes out, and there's good morning wishes. And, but the one thing is the overflowing garbage bins, the stinking, rotting garbage that sits in these rusted cans that are older than I am. Why? Why can we not have a proper garbage receptacle? I don't know why. I really don't. But I do know something. We do have a lot of ethnic culture that uses that park on the weekends. And you know what? People will go through the park for a stroll and they'll see these garbage bins and who do they blame? Not the city. It's not the city that gets blamed. It's the people who are of different ethnic cultures. 
and it's a shame. If you want to come down to Springbank Park for a walk on the weekends, they would love to have you. They're the most friendly, diverse culture I have ever been encountered with because I'm from London, not Toronto. But now London is starting to get a bit of a Toronto feel and it's really cool. It's really cool to be out in that and to feel like you're part of an international place on the weekend. You know, I have a girlfriend who's uh, an artist here in the city, a musician, and she's worked really hard. But it's been the province who's helped fund her with grants and subsidies to get her music going. So there are programs available. For Thanks, young Veronica. Artists. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Kyle Thompson for Ward 9. Okay. Although most of you probably wouldn't agree, I fancy myself as a bit of an artist. So Paul, of course we need tax money given to artists. I'm, I'm agreeing with most of uh, everything else that you're putting down there though, bud. Um, that said, I didn't know a ton about uh, what the city actually does for local artists, so I had to once again call on some friends, and this is what I found out. We do have several programs in place for the arts already in London. Uh, as Ben alluded to, uh, in 2015, we hired a music development officer tasked with tuning up London's downtown as a music and live arts destination as part of a two-year, $300,000 plan. Arts tourists uh, tend to spend about double what all other types of tourists do when they visit, so this sounds like a worthwhile endeavor, and it seems to be working. With amazing festivals in the summer and top talent visiting from all over the world, London is now a, desti a destination on the international scene. What I'm hearing at the local artist level, however, is that the London scene is still very much an old boys club, with funding and opportunities being doled out to the same cast of characters over and over again. If we're going to continue to dump money into funding local talent, and I do believe that we should, I'd like to have a measuring stick to see just exactly what our return is on these investments and also that the opportunities are being distributed equally or at least competitively uh, with all artists getting an equal crack at them. Thanks. Thank you, Kyle. And Matt Miller for Ward 9. So when you hear government and creativity, what's the first thing you think of? For me, it's creative accounting. And that's not something that we want to be encouraging. Now, we have many talented artists and creative folks here in London, so let's leave the arts to the artists. And I think uh, Mr. Van Meerbergen was looking at my notes back there because he said a lot of what I was going to say. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but of course, with, as with anything else, we don't want to create any unnecessary barriers. And if someone comes to us with a good idea that we can help them with, then we should definitely look into it. But uh, it's not the government's place to be leading the artistic projects. And believe me, I'm the last person you want to be in charge of uh, fostering the arts in London. <laughs> so from festivals to music events to shows, I feel like we're doing quite well in this area, and we should continue to let the creators create. Okay, moving on to the last of our key topics. This is the last of the topics that have been provided in advance to the candidates. The question for you is regarding wards 9 and 10, the ward that you are running for. Um, obviously, neighboring wards, there are some similarities, but also very unique in many ways. So the question I have for candidates is, what is the major issue facing your ward in the next four years? Anna? Uh, yes, um, yeah, I think from what was originally provided, yeah. So we, this will be our, the last of our key topics, okay? This is about um, uh, the major issue facing your ward, and we'll be starting this time with Virginia Ridley for Ward 10. So I created a list um, and I didn't have to think too hard about it. I had to answer my phone and answer my emails for a week and I can tell you what the major issues are now and what they're going to continue to be. The people of Ward 10 are concerned about raf um, traffic, they're concerned about roads, they're concerned about road quality, expansions, safety, they're concerned about communication and engagement, they're concerned about attracting business and attracting and retaining talent. 
Uh, in terms of London, we're looking at bigger things such as continued growth and development. And that merges with what I'm hearing from the people of Ward 10 as well. So yesterday I had a meeting with a uh, Western um, Student Union president charged with engagement and we talked about the need to retain the talent that we're training, being a school that is uh, universities and colleges. And we talked about how the city can work cooperatively with those uh, institutions to do that. I regularly have conversations with business owners uh, and talk about supporting business and supporting what the city is doing. Right? The government does have a role, but it's about creating the community. It's about creating the environment uh, that businesses can thrive in. So I think the most major issues for the ward are always going to be the same. I'm going to get two calls a day saying there's a pothole and people are speeding and um, my street's not safe. And those are things that we need to take care of. Um, and then the other one is really about managing our growth, retaining our talent, growing businesses and creating opportunities. Thank you, Virginia. Anna Hopkins for Ward 9. Thank you. Major issues facing Ward 9, planning issues. How we move around the ward, balancing growth, cut through traffic, congestion, that is a constant challenge for the past four years. I've sat on planning as well for the past couple years, and there's usually one or three applications, planning applications on the agenda. The Southwest Area Plan is a place for new growth. This is where growth is going to happen in the city of London. It's me to the north, to the northwest. Going into the future, it's going to be in the south and southwest. How we build while managing infrastructure, environment, costs, and keeping a qual quality life is a constant challenge for me. How do we maintain the vitality of our current neighborhoods while accommodating new growth? All those are questions that I'm constantly being asking myself. A colleague and I brought forward a motion to coordinate construction projects in Ward 9 and across the city. Sometimes it can be as simple as a better notification to the community on what roads are to be closed. City and private developers need to make sure they do a better job coordinating projects and notifications. I've been pushing that for a long time. If you know in advance, you can plan. We need new investments to keep our neighborhoods vital. How do we accommodate these new investments while maintaining the character of our neighborhoods? Thank you. Thank you, Anna. For Ward 10, Paul Van Meerbergen. Thank you. Um, clearly, the, the leading issue in Ward 10, as I dare say across the city, is the BRT and how through social engineering and social engineers, um, it's being forced upon us when most of us don't want it. Now, assuming with a new council, <clears throat> excuse me, assuming with a new council that we can kill off the BRT, the real issue that's left, um, certainly the next one uh, that I would say, is uh, the level of taxation. Uh, it, it's the long-term job for council over the next four years to control these taxes and, of course, the spending that generates it. To make sure that tax rates are at least below the rate of inflation. Most Ward 10 residents I've been speaking with are telling me no more than 1% to 2%. A true rate, below the true rate of inflation and not some um, cockamamie construction rate of inflation that was, that was used uh, earlier. So these tax rates Seniors are finding, and the working poor, they're getting beyond affordability. And we have to keep that in mind um, as we proceed over the next four years. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Also for Ward 10, Kevin May. Okay, well, I mean, we've heard some of them tonight, but there are many issues concerning the city that we must address over the next four years. But one thing I do see as pressing for a family-friendly ward like Ward 10 is the need for complete street design and accessibility. Last winter, during, we had people literally trapped in their homes for days. 
People in wheelchairs risking their lives going up Wonderland Road because the sidewalks aren't plowed. We have unsafe crosswalks and parents no longer feel safe walking their kids to school or letting them ride their bikes in our communities. Our accessibility committee literally had to threaten to resign to get to the city to consider their recommendations. There's an old saying, if you want someone to do something, you make it easy for them. We've not made it easy for Londoners to choose in alternative forms of transportation. We must keep London moving forward and start demanding that our streets are designed to be accessible for all ages, abilities, and modes of transportation. And stop seeing pedestrians and cyclist safety as nothing more than an afterthought. My goal at City Council is to lower residential speed limits, provide funding for safe infrastructure like all age protected bike lanes and well-maintained accessible sidewalks. I'm looking forward to working with the federal government on new legislation for, national, for a national accessibility framework. I plan to learn what funding might be available to help municipalities bridge the budget gap to make a truly accessible community. We're all here tonight because we want to build a stronger community. But a community without accessibility, it's not a community at all. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. For Ward 9, Ben Charlebois. Being a, a, being a municipal councillor and being a strong local representative uh, requires that you, you're, you're available to your constituents by phone, by email, that you answer those day-to-day -day questions, that you, you talk about the things that people think about on their way to work, like speed bumps and potholes. But I, and this is the, a bit of a theme of, of everything I've talked about today, you need to be able to do that while keeping an eye on the bigger picture for the city because you may live in Ward 9, but you don't just exist in Ward 9. You go to eat in Ward 13, you go to school in Ward 6, you work in Ward 10, etc. cetera. So from my view, the biggest issue needs to be, we need to start focusing on the, bitter, the bigger picture and what that looks like for London's economy. And so the bigger picture is whether or not we are able to keep up with the pace of change. We will have to keep up with the pace of change in order to attract new jobs and new industries, um, like, like some, of the, some of which are currently setting up in London right now in the IT fields, uh, in information technologies. London has done a, an all right job so far at, a, at attracting and, and retaining um, jobs in these fields. And these are the kind of jobs that my generation and, and your kids' generations and your grandkids uh, Will, will work if they're, if they're able to stay in London. And the idea is to build a London that they will be able to stay in and want to stay in. We graduate so many talented people across the city, but so few are able to stay because we haven't sold ourselves as a livable place. We haven't provided that vision, that bigger picture. Um, we haven't pitched London to Londoners as a place, as a city that gets things done. People want to live in a, in a city that gives them options. So not only does that mean thinking bigger, it means becoming advocates for the things that Londoners care about to other levels of government. Um, Kitchener, Kitchener, Waterloo, and Hamilton, those are our, our local rivals in terms, of, in terms of city building. They're both investing in culture and in transit. They're both becoming places that businesses want to set up and where people want to live. And businesses nowadays are increasingly, the high value businesses are increasingly locating themselves near places where their talent wants to live. That's why they're going to the KW area. That's why they're going to the, to the GTA. Thanks, Ben. Sorry to cut you off. That is your time. <laughs> Veronica Warner, also for Ward 9. Okay, I'm Veronica Warner. Um, well, for Byron, for sure, it's the trucks. It's the big dump trucks. It's the cement trucks. It's the 18-wheelers that get carjacked or hijacked on Snake Hill. It's the tie-ups. It's the seniors that are in the six buildings all along the parkway. We've got 940 Springbank, and then we have another three buildings, and then we have a seniors building. These people need a safe place to live. They can't be taking their scooters down the road with the trucks in the middle of winter. It's not going to happen. Those trucks need to be diverted through Oxford Street Extension. Why did we buy Oxford Street Extension if we're not going to use it? And Lambeth, our lovely Lambeth. 
I don't know what's going to happen with Lambeth after this construction is finished, but I do hope that somebody implements some crosswalks because how do these people get across that busy, busy road? And who's going to make sure and monitor the traffic that goes through Lambeth? Are there going to be speed bumps? Are there going to be flashing signs that say you're going too fast? Because we all know they need something. That village isn't going to make it if we don't do something. And neither is Byron if we don't finish and get those trucks diverted away from the parkway. And the parkway is that of Springbank and commissioners going through the little village of Byron. Has to change. We must do better. There must be better planning because we cannot wait until 2033 for Snake Hill to be flattened out. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Kyle Thompson for Ward 9. Lambeth, Byron, and the surrounding rural areas are special places. I'm not sure that sometimes we appreciate what amazing communities we live in. On any given day, you can hike through gorgeous forests, kayak in the Thames, go for a skate and storybook, or at Lambeth Arena, home to the most loyal hockey families in Canada, of which I'm proudly a part of one. Uh, we have livestock, apple orchards, and yeah, even a pretty good strawberry farm. Uh, we know our neighbors, and going out for a night on the town usually means taking a box of beer over to one of their garages. We're different out here on the West. We've got our own identities and our own way of living. And so I would suggest that the single biggest threat facing us is protecting that and not letting a bunch of out-of-touch councillors downtown make huge decisions that threaten our quality of life. Put somebody down there that won't just vote with the crowd. Put someone down there who will listen to what you want and bring it forward no matter how unpopular it is with the other 13 councillors. We're on the outskirts over here. It's too easy to be ignored. We need somebody loud that can make stuff happen. Thanks. Thank you, Kyle. Matt Miller for Ward 9. Well, Kyle and I are on the same wavelength. Um, everything that I've been hearing from people, is their biggest issue, it's not a concrete issue, like fix this, do that. It's that they're being ignored. People feel like they're never getting an answer when they're asking questions. They don't know what's going on. Things just happen. Then they're fi they find out about it afterwards. And <laughs> people just want someone to listen to them and to value their opinions and to put that into practice. So um, the biggest issue facing Ward 9 is people want their voice to be heard and they want someone on council that will represent them and not just the rest of London. Thank you, Matt. Gary Manley for Ward 10. I think the major issue facing Ward 10 in the next four years is further development of any of the remaining area of land in the far Western and southwestern most edges of the ward. The traffic along Wonderland Road and along Southdale Road West is already fairly heavy. The addition of any more commercial and residential development in this area is going to push the roads to their capacity. We will no doubt be looking at widening Southdale Road west of Wonderland Road in the coming years. As for Wonderland Road, the implementation of intelligent transport, transportation system traffic signals would do much more to improve traffic flow along this stretch. Another one of my short answers. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Virginia Ridley for War 10. Oh, sorry, we started with Virginia. <laughs> that flew by, my goodness. Okay, wonderful. So this is the fun part. Now we get to take questions from the audience. I may have a few myself. Uh, just a few notes. Um, please try to be concise. I know sometimes people have several questions they'd like to ask. It's really difficult for the candidates to answer multiple questions in one response. So please try to just narrow it down to one clear question. If you have a question you'd like to ask, raise your hand. Andrew will be walking around with the microphone collecting those questions. We'll try to uh, accommodate as many as we possibly can. And the candidates will be able to stay in their seats for these responses. And you will each have one minute for each of these responses as well. Um, so let's start with a question from Andrew or yeah, gonna, I'm gonna, gonna kick us off. 
I'll kick us off. I want to get, uh, I've seen your two hands and I've got you. Um, so I, there's been a lot of talk um, about different issues, but one thing that hasn't come up a lot in uh, the campaign is the environment. So specifically, I want to know, we're one of the only cities of our size in Canada that doesn't have any green bin program or plan to have one. So I'm wondering first um, if you would support a green bin program and why or why not. I'll ask uh, everybody on the panel. Perfect. So we'll start this time with Anna Hopkins. You have one minute on green bins. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for the question. And while on council, I did support green bins, but unfortunately, we were unable to implement them uh, this time out because they weren't in the budget. As well, the province was going through a review where we had to... Uh, where they were coming up with, with stricter guidelines. So we know now what the guidelines are. Council is looking at or the, uh, introducing green bins and very supportive. I've heard from a number of residents moving into Ward 9 from other cities saying that we have a very antiquated system. Thank you, Anna. Paul, you have a one minute on green bins. Thank you. Um, yeah, this, this issue um, crops up every few years or so. Um, clearly, this is a very expensive program that deals with the most natural part of the landfill. And by that, I mean it's the most easy that breaks down uh, and takes up very little space as it breaks down. We've spent thousands and thousands of dollars as a city um, to burn off gases. And I'd like, for example, for, for these uh, uh, flame burners, that we have and that we've invested so heavily to burn off that gas um, to be used more productively, perhaps to generate electricity and, and to put on the grid or even provide gas in the gas grid. The fact is, it sounds great. It's, it's what I refer to as greenwashing. You throw millions of dollars at a, um, at a program for the city to go around and pick up potato peels and bits of lettuce um, and th these are things that, it, as I said, in the landfill, break down naturally. Okay. Thanks, so Paul. Sorry, it, that is and, one minute And it one will result in well over a one, one and a half percent tax increase to pay for it. Thank you. Kevin? Uh, well, I, uh, I already mentioned the need for a uh, green bin program. I absolutely think there is. Uh, we're probably one of the few communities that don't have it already. Uh, we did do a test pilot in 2011. Um, I, the fact is our landfills are almost near capacity. Uh, if we don't do something soon, it's going to cost us more later. And the, re the, the reason it didn't work in 2011 is because there was no other reason to. Uh, I spoke with my sister-in-law about it. They have them in their community. And the reason they didn't use them, they, they had them. They didn't use them for years until basically there were restrictions on their garbage and now it's part of their everyday life. Um, this isn't hard to do. Um, it, it's, it, there is room in the budget to make for it and it's the right thing to do along with other initiatives that will help our environment long term. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. And uh, Ben. Uh, so, so I'd echo that sentiment. I, so I, I was a, a, a Western grad uh, probably more recently than anybody here. And uh, um, I, I was involved in politics on campus as well. And, and so I spent a lot of time talking to students about the things that they care about. And a lot of Western students, a huge number of Western students are from Toronto and the GTA. And they laughed at, at London, to put it succinctly. They laughed at London for not having a green bin program because we are decades behind on that. And I think that Londoners tend to be a fairly environmentally conscious group we tend, to, we, we tend to support these type of initiatives. It's just something that has never been made a political priority. Uh, and I, I think it's something that there's, there's room for growth on. And I also believe that, uh, that as, a, as a city councillor, you are a grassroots activist and we have a responsibility to advocate, again, to the provincial and federal levels, levels of government to make sure that um, you know, if there is an action being taken on being environmentally conscious, uh, Londoners are still able to, to contribute however, however we might be able to. Thank you, Ben. Veronica. <laughs> if you just push the button on top, so we want to make sure we get your answer there. London uh, mm -hmm. still hasn't really got it together with the recycling of blue bin waste. Our parks, like Springbank in Ward 9 has no blue bin recycling. 
Why? I don't know. But I do know about green bin waste, and we have a company here in London called Orga World. And if you live anywhere in the south or southwest, you will smell that lovely stench of rotting garbage on a late summer night when there's a little bit of air movement, and you'll think, what the heck is that? That stinks, and you go back in your house. So I found out this summer, after doing a bit of research, that the people over in the White Oaks area and that uh, where Orga World is, they actually got together and sued Orga World, and they received a million dollars for having to put up with this stinky stench. Nobody told me. As far as green bin waste goes, Ottawa has it, and minimally, they have to pay $8 million a year to Orga World, because there's only two green, green bin waste disposal companies, Orga World's in Ottawa, Orga World is in London. Okay, they thanks, Veronica. Sorry, that is your time. Research it. Well, I certainly need to. Um, I do agree with, uh, with Paul to some extent uh, that there are a lot of these uh, sexy green uh, initiatives that you know everyone wants to undertake. And I hate to play devil's advocate here, but I mean, to undertake something that uh, is a, a massive investment um, that is ultimately left up to um, user participation at the individual household level and business level is somewhat of a gamble. Um, there's obviously a green bin program in Toronto where I work. Um, I routinely see green bins overflowing with non-green bin items. and being picked up and put into the same receptacles. So um, in theory, I think green bins are a fantastic idea, um, but they would definitely have to come with uh, some sort of education uh, for the end user. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, so in theory, the green bin program sounds good, but um, there are a lot of rural areas that we have. People do composting. Not everyone needs a green bin. Um, Maybe we could have a discussion, have uh, some sort of opt-in, but that would have to be done before implementing the program, obviously, to see if it would be worth it. And um, we'd have to check the price tag because we don't want to saddle the taxpayers with this expensive program if it's not going to be effective. Thank you, Matt. Gary? I also agree with Paul that it's very expensive when it rots on its own. What I want to see is a hazardous material pickup. I go to the dump quite often with my batteries, fluorescent lights, and those curly bulbs that have mercury in them, and I never see anybody else there doing that. So I can only imagine how much dangerous pollution is going into the dump, which will be going into our water system in years from now, that hazardous material is much more uh, valuable to pick up than old carrots and potatoes. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. Oh, can you pass the mic down to Virginia, please? Thank you. I'll keep my answer short. I uh, supported the Green Bin Initiative when it came forward to the multi-year budget in 2015, and I would continue to support it. Our Earth, our environment is worth protecting, it's worth saving, and it's worth long-term investments in. We need to maintain capacity. Someone said we're almost full. That's actually not the case. The cell that we're currently using right now is filling up. The problem is, is that as you do studies for future cells, the uh, rules change, become stricter. It becomes more expensive to use more cells. So we have to be very cognizant about what we're putting in those cells. I think that we need to do more education. The problem starts at home and in our kitchens and us looking at what we're buying, what we're wasting, and what we're putting in the trash. Um, the city needs to do a bit of that, but we also need to make that uh, organic collection available to residents. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. We have another question from the crowd, I believe, this time, and I think this one is just for Kyle. Hello. Hi, Kyle. Sorry, I'll stand up. Right I'm right Hi. here. I live in Ward 9, so you could be my counselor. And... I want to talk to you about safe consumption sites. You said, as a general rule, that people won't travel to them. Well, the numbers from the last six months clearly contradict that statement, with 1,500 people coming through 
several lives being saved, upwards of 100 people being sent to other community services that could help them. You also said that safe consumption sites need to be done the right way. Well, what do you think the right way is, and where would you put one? Uh, actually, just to clarify, what, what I did say was, uh, and the study I was referencing was done uh, in Parkdale, Toronto, um, and that study suggested that, uh, on average, the, the average intravenous drug user will only travel up to one kilometer um, to use at a supervised uh, site. So I don't know what the demographics are um, of the uh, current uh, temporary site. I don't know if people are traveling from Ward 9 um, down to near Beale to, to use drugs in that site. Um, and I, to be totally honest with you, I mean, I don't have the answer. I'm not, uh, I'm not the guy to ask when it comes to rolling it out. I'm saying what we need to do is take experts in the field and really think about strategically placing them um, in places where we're not going to attract a bad element, um, obviously near school grounds, um, near parks. Um, and that's not my area of expertise, but I think we do need to spend some time and, and roll it out properly and, and get people in to do more studies uh, and not base everything just on one test pilot at one site in the downtown area. Right? Thanks, Kyle. Sorry, that is Sorry. your time. Mm -hmm. Now, I would like to open that up to the other candidates. Would anyone else like to comment on that question um, regarding specifically? OK, sure. Well, I've got a great idea. Because I hear next year that our city hall wants to move, that they want to move that whole building into another office space. What a great rehab facility that would make. And in the bottom level, they have these toilets, and they flush just like Niagara Falls, and there's a fellow in there cleaning it up. I mean, that place is cleaner than our hospitals. So I think that'd be a great spot. Okay, would anyone else like to comment? Um, Anna, sure. We can pass the mic to Anna there. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, just because uh, we do have an application coming to planning, I think, in the next uh, month on... Um, uh, we've got, we're going through the process, sorry, of implementing our official plan and our zoning bylaws to allow for safe injection sites. So uh, we have put it in our official plan because if you do not put it in the official plan, you'll find that these safe consumption sites can go anywhere in the city. And staff have looked at uh, working with the uh, London Health Unit to see where the most use uh, would be and accommodating those um, areas to allow for safe consumption sites. So in other words, you're not going to put some, a safe consumption site up in an industrial mall when most of the users, for instance, are downtown. So I think the city is doing a, their job to put in it into the official plan and the uh, zoning bylaw process as well. Okay, thank you very much. All right, I think we're gonna move along to our next question, which I believe is for all candidates. Hi, thanks. Um, I'm here to tell all the candidates to not discuss selling London Hydro at an illegally convened meeting so that the ombudsperson has to get involved, the integrity commissioners. My question that I'd like each of you to answer is, what is your position about retaining or selling London Hydro? What will you stand behind? Okay, we'll be starting this time with Paul Van Muirbergen. Sure, can you repeat the question? Sure, it's regarding uh, whether you support uh, selling or retaining London Hydro. Sure. Sorry, you just grab the mic there so that everyone can hear you. Sure. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, as I understand it, it's pertaining to London Hydro. L London Hydro is uh, a gem that we have in our city. I certainly don't uh, advocate to sell it off. In fact, in the, in the previous council, there was a, uh, a push uh, by the previous mayor to um, sell it, 
this resource to an Edmonton-based group, which uh, I voted against. London Hydro is efficient. London Hydro uh, provides great service to our community and, uh, to, to my way of thinking, um, should not be uh, sold off to private interests. Thank you. Kevin? Great, thank you. Um, sorry, I'm just going to stand up. I, sorry. Sorry, John. <laughs> uh, I, no, I, I absolutely would agree that London Hydro, and I, I'm pretty sure in the last council they, they agreed as well. It, it, it's a, it's, it's a moneymaker. I mean, it absolutely brings profit. Uh, it keeps our hydro rates down in, in, in London. Um, I, I'm sorry to keep it short, but you no, know, I absolutely stand for keeping London Hydro under the municipality. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, ben, it's your turn. And feel free to stay in your seats, folks. It saves us from cutting your head off when we're uh, shooting you. No problem. Ben. Thank you for your question. Uh, I'm not sorry for keeping it short. Public utilities belong in the hands of the public. Okay. Thank you. Veronica. Thanks, Ben. I agree with Ben. <laughs> These are getting shorter and shorter, my goodness. You do have up to a minute, just so you know. Kyle. Well, then I'll talk a little bit longer, um, but not much. I, of course, I, uh, I agree with uh, the, everyone else's sentiment that uh, we should keep it in the hands of the public. In fact, I uh, did make a music video at the provincial level about what happens when we sell off our public interest in hydro. You can check that out at www.thewackmcs.com. Thanks. <laughs> Go check sure out his video. Like it's good. That. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Matt, go ahead. Um, yeah, unless there's some financial reason to sell it off, which I'm not aware of, then uh, I'd say just keep it as is. If it's generating us money, why get rid of it? Thank you, Gary. By all means, keep it. I believe last year we got a few million bucks from the London Hydro to go to the city. And you can see how it worked out when uh, Kathleen Wynne sold our Ontario Hydro. <laughs> Maybe we can... Maybe we can save some money getting our own hydro when uh, rates go up somewhere else in that, but uh, I believe we need to keep it. If it's making money, keep it, definitely. Thank you. Uh, Virginia, sorry, can you pass the mic down to Virginia? Thanks. Uh, I would support retention of London Hydro. Uh, we do get annual dividends in the past couple of years. We've got special dividends, which have uh, been an increased amount. Uh, we were able to invest those dividends into uh, special funds that allow us to uh, bring uh, quality things to London and community investments. So uh, like everyone else, I just don't, there's no argument to sell London Hydro. I think that ship sailed on, and whoever was making the argument sailed on it, so. Thank you, Anna. Yes, and uh, thank you for the question on council. It has not been a discussion to, to sell it at all. It is a, a public asset. It's uh, bringing in great uh, revenue to the city. I do know we annually uh, are given updates by the stakeholder. London Hydro reports to us every year, and they are a well-organized uh, well machine. It's really uh, a great asset to our city. Perfect, thank you. Okay, we're gonna take another question from the crowd, I believe. We have a question about BRT. We've already talked about BRT, but it is a hot topic, so we'll take uh, one more question about it. Bill Brock, former London Transit Manager. My question is to Anne and Virginia. Will you tell us how the proposed BRT system makes service in your ward better, and who's gonna pay the deficit? Go ahead, Virginia, when you're ready. I'll just push the button there, if it turned off. No? How about now? Okay. Oh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Brock. Um, so as I indicated when I made some of my comments off script there about BRT, uh, we need to look at it not in terms of laying it on top of the existing London Transit Commission routes. We need to look at refeeding and rerouting. We need to look at the right size vehicles and getting better service in wards like Ward 10. Ward 10 is far away from any of the BRT lines, absolutely. The impact to Ward 10 in regards to the shift plan is minimal, but what we need to do is we need to look at removing the four, the six, the 13, the 17, the lines that are gonna be duplicated through BRT, feeding those back 
back into the system into a more effective way that's just going to provide better service to people in Ward 10, in Ward 9, in those other wards that are going to feed back into the main BRT line. Um, so we also heard about um, you know the amount that we're investing in our transit system, and you touched on deficits. We haven't been funding our transit to the right level. Our ridership is high, um, and our ridership will continue to grow. And so investing in the operating cost of transit is appropriate for us to do. Thanks, Virginia. Anna? Uh, yes, thank you for the question. So maybe uh, at the beginning of this year, I held a community meeting asking the question, what is uh, in it for Ward 9? And it's a question that I hear over and over again. And it's important that we understand exactly what the BRT is and how the improvements to the to the feeder routes, uh, how they work into the BRT system and how the BRT system supports the feeder routes. So obviously in Ward 9, it's very difficult to get around the ward, let alone getting down to downtown. So we need to improve on that. That is part of the plan, part of the conversation that is happening with London Transit. We're also uh, up Im improving ridership by, in, uh, we've uh, allowed for children under the age of 12 to re uh, uh, ride for free. Uh, the youth passes, uh, reducing those costs as well. So increasing ridership uh, definitely will, will help into the future with the deficit. So there's a lot of things that are going on to uh, improve transit. And that's one thing, if there are concerns in Sorry, the community. Sorry, Anna, I'm going to have to cut you off there. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I believe we also have another BRT-related question just for Paul. So we'll take that one as well. Mr. Van Meerbergen, what about the seniors, youth, and individuals with disabilities, which all can all of the individuals who are unable to drive, and students who rely on London Transit? I, re I myself as a Londoner rely on the on the London Transit and in, and in favor of the BRT. But how will you support me as a Londoner if the BRT is disposed of and my de my transportation is disposed of too? Okay. Are you clear on that one, Paul? Um, I believe it's if they're if you're opposed to the BRT, how will you support uh, transit specifically for uh, youth uh, like himself? Well, okay. As I stated in my um, and thank you for the question. Um, as I stated in my opening address, um, to be against the BRT is not to be against transit. Two different things. We've got a half a billion dollar boondoggle going into something that's not going to produce results for London, um, as opposed to having a fair LTC system that serves London. Two different things. I support um, the transit, especially increasing transit to industrial areas that aren't currently serviced. Um, that has to uh, be, be dealt with uh, virtually immediately because uh, companies that are, are on the outskirts or the edges of the city need that to get workers and much needed employment to people um, ac across the city. So I'm looking for a transportation system that benefits all Londoners. Okay, thank you. Um I think we have time for just one more question. We do have to keep moving along, so we want to squeeze this one in. Yeah, I think um, just to switch off of BRT, because we focused a lot on that, one of the biggest frustrations for a lot of Londoners are the amount of unused uh, city properties and uh, the amount of buildings that are being bought up specifically by one developer that owns between 40 to 60% of the businesses or buildings downtown. Um, I look at things like the old central library that's going unused and eventually will be torn down. So what are you gonna do to prevent um, unused buildings in the city and uh, from having developers monopolize uh, our city moving forward? Okay, we'll be starting this time with Kevin. Um, no, thanks for the question again, Andrew. Um, well, we saw something similar in Windsor. Um, 
with a similar, if not the same, developer, to be honest. They, um, I think it's important that if our developers are, we, we do absolutely need to work with our developers and make sure that there's an environment for them to bring something that's going to uh, tie into our heritage and our cultural fabric. Um, and yeah, if, if buildings are being sent vacant uh, for years and years, um, perhaps we should, and I believe we do have a vacant, um, uh, a vacant building tax that is possibly being considered. Um, but absolutely, we can't have uh, the downtown core, and I'm seeing them uh, in other areas where we're waiting on years from now. It's an investment, right? We're buying low, and we're waiting until the price goes up when things come up, and then all of a sudden we're, we're jacking up the price, and, and that's how we're making our living. Um, the, the, the land belongs to the city, the land belongs to the people, and we need to take control of that to as best of our abilities that we can. Thank, Thank you, you, Kevin. Uh, if you just pass the mic down to Ben there, Ben is next on this question. Gary, thank you. <laughs> so the law with regards to this matter has recently changed. Um, it's now the case that, so it used to be the case that whenever developers disagreed with the city, they could take it to the Interior Municipal Board and, uh, and overrule the city's decision if, uh, if an adjudicator deemed it necessary. Now it's the case that whatever is in your city plan is basically airtight. So it comes down to councillors to have an idea of what they want their city to look like. In particular, I think believe we're mostly talking about the downtown right now. It comes down to councillors to have an idea of, uh, of what they want their downtown to look like and to enshrine that vision in the city plan and to be able to, uh, to, be able to communicate that in, in a way that it's, it's clear to developers and it's not ambiguous. Uh, to the extent that developers can take advantage of, of the city. Because ultimately, it's the councillors who are accountable to Londoners. It's not developers. Developers don't have to think about the long term. Um, they, they don't have to think you know, past the lifetime of their current project, um, whereas we have to live here. And, and we need to make sure that we are planning for the future and that that plan is, um, that plan is strong enough that it's able to withstand whatever stresses might might be forced upon it by uh, by developers who are looking to get ahead. Thanks, Ben. Veronica. Yeah, my views and opinions on our heritage properties and our central library. I would pretty much guess it's a heritage property. Um, our laws are very laxy-daisy, and these developers, they can sit on these properties and let them rot. And we've seen that happen this past summer with the Cedars building across from the river. I know it was an inhabitable, but it wasn't 10 years ago. And two years ago, it was deemed heritage property. And my question was, why didn't anybody enforce uh, Drulo Holdings and make that building so it was going to be preserved when it was deemed heritage. I, so now, you know, in my hair studio, this is an interesting topic because somebody today actually brought it up about the Central Library downtown. What is going to happen with that building? Are we going to see much of the same that we've been seeing? I hope not. I love London. I'd like to see some of our heritage protected. Thanks. Thanks, Veronica. Kyle? Well, when we talk about unused buildings and, uh, and the heritage uh, designation in particular, it's, this topic kind of drives me a bit nuts. If you look at our ward in particular, um, MV McEachern School in Lambeth uh, is slated to be a state-of-the-art health facility that's much needed in the community. Um, to uh, the incumbent councillor Hopkins' credit, she did vote against deeming it a heritage property because absolutely no one in that area agrees with it. Um, I went to my first dance in grade six at that school, uh, mm -hmm. and I don't, I don't agree with it being a heritage property. I know there's more to it than that. Um, but when we've got a uh, council voted nine to five to ignore the residents of Lambeth, deem it a heritage property anyway, even though it's nowhere close to the shape that it was in um, when uh, back in history, which would have allocated it, that heritage designation. Sorry, I'm stumbling over my words here. Um, I just believe that we need somebody on council that can actually sway the vote because uh, a councillor in Old East shouldn't be telling people in Lambeth 
what buildings in their neighborhood are heritage sites. Thanks, That's Kyle. why these buildings aren't getting developed. Thanks. Thank you. Matt? So there's a few things at play here. Um, with the heritage buildings, um, some of them were, uh, people say they're heritage sites. They're on a list, but they're not actually designated heritage buildings. So then you're kind of at the mercy of whoever owns it. And um, with all these heritage buildings, um, you, you're going to end up saddling the taxpayer with um, looking after them. So you don't want to just be slapping that label onto everything. And um, with the vacant buildings, that you kind of you don't no one wants to see vacant properties vacant buildings but on the other hand you have property rights and you don't want to be uh, dictating to people that they have to do this and this with their property I mean with vacant lots it's fine but then if you don't like this building or it's in the way you have to move where, where do we draw the line thank you Gary I'd like to bring up the point that uh, we, the taxpayers, gave Fanshawe College $29 million to move downtown for their two schools. If they can do that with Fanshawe, why don't we get with some of the contractors, offer to give them some money to make these vacant buildings into accessible housing or something like that. But to me, even though college is great, $29 million when they're supported by the provincial government, and I think it's more difficult to run your college when you have it separated by five miles and they have so many acres out there that the, the city should look at to uh, giving some money to contractors to help them make their building into something. Thank you, Gary. Virginia? Uh, I lost where you went, Andrew, but in answer to your question, um, it's things like the vacancy tax rebate. Uh, this council has addressed that and we need to not enter into those kind of tax rebates. People shouldn't get credit um, for having empty buildings. They should be encouraged to fill those spaces and fill those buildings um, and have good use on them. I um, tend to uh, take the recommendations of my colleagues who sit on the planning committee because I know that they are very thoughtful in their decision making regarding planning matters, uh, considering the heritage and the uh, needs of the community. And uh, luckily, uh, so far in Ward 10, there haven't been a number of uh, planning matters that need to be addressed. Um, but I do consider each of the recommendations of the committee and typically side with the committee in terms of preserving uh, the heritage that needs to be preserved um, and not the ones that don't uh, and wouldn't support any vacancy rebates. I think that uh, anywhere that people are saving money by keeping things empty doesn't encourage them to fill those spaces. Thank you. Anna? Thank you. And I too wouldn't support vacancy rebates. I, I know on uh, planning, we've addressed a number of applications. They're quite common about vacant buildings, applications coming to demolish them. Then we designate them heritage, and then it goes to LPAT or the OMB. And it, it's a concern. I, I, I think we are trying to uh, understand the process and what we can do. I know a couple of colleagues uh, of mine were working at seeing if we can strengthen the bylaws around uh, the heritage buildings to make the owners more uh, responsible if they do have a ho uh, house that's designated to take better care of it, to um, you know, uh, build, put up the wood around the windows, make sure the mold is not getting in. Another thing that we've done on planning too, uh, when it comes, we can't tell developers what to do with their land. And so we have a lot of parking lots downtown that are vacant up for uh, uh, development. And we've really encouraged, uh, we have that conversation when their leases come up, what are you doing? What are you planning? When are you planning on building? Fortunately, again, we Thank can't you, force Anna. them. Sorry. Paul. Thank you. Um, clearly, there are a lot of vacancies downtown. There's no doubt about it. Um, so the key to addressing that problem is to generate interest from the marketplace, from uh, business investors, uh, from out of town. That, that means um, getting LEDC very active, um, getting our city very active in promoting, including our developers and the landowners. 
um, to try and find and, and receive buyers. I mean, it's, it's such a hidden treasure that we have in our downtown core, um, but I think it needs to be pushed more, and we can find these investors. Um, they're around, and if it means we have to go further afield, then, then let's do that. But there, there is a market response and a market answer to this. As far as the heritage goes, um, we only have to look at some of these old buildings that have been fixed up with private money, and, and I'm sorry, the name escapes me, but there's this old inn on Grand Avenue that was completely refurbished, and it's gorgeous, and it was, it, it's, it's now a hub, it's, it's busy. Sorry? Oh, Idlewood, sorry, that was it. The Idlewood is um, a, a fabulous, in my mind, example of uh, private sector investment going in there and uh, making some good things happen. Thank you, Paul. Okay, uh, we have time to squeeze in just one last quickie question, and it is one of mine. I get to ask one question tonight. We're going to be starting with Ben, and the question I have is simply, do you live in your ward? So if you could pass the mic down to Ben, we'll find out where everyone lives. And I'll remind you that Ben is running for Ward 9. So I am running for Ward 9, and I currently live in Ward 9. However, I live in the slice of Ward 9 that has been cut off and thrust into Ward 10. So as of November, I will not live in my ward. Okay. Veronica? I live and I work out of my home in Ward 9 for the past 20 years across from Springbank Park. Come and visit me anytime. <laughs> Thank you, Kyle, also for Ward 9. I live in Ward 9 and I'm going to die in Ward 9. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out in southwest London, born and raised, out in Lambeth. Uh, my family's been there for three generations, and I have no plans on leaving. Okay, and uh, Gary lives in, or Gary's in running for Ward 10. Ward 10 for 33 years. Sorry, I was speaking over you. You do live in Ward 10. I live in Ward, not Ward, no. I live in Ward 10 for th the last 33 years. <laughs> That's fine. I just wanted to make sure everyone could hear you. I wasn't interrupting. Uh, Virginia. Yes. <laughs> When I moved to my house, it was Ward 7, later became Ward 9, then the boundaries changed. I live on the wrong side of the street, across from Springbank Park in Ward 10. <laughs> and Paul, running for Ward 10? And you're certainly welcome in Ward 10, and I, I live in Ward 10. Um, I've lived in Ward 10 for uh, many, many years. Thank you, and Kevin? Um, I've lived in Ward 10 for many years, went to high school in Ward 10, best darn ward in London. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> On that note, we are going to move to our closing statements. So each candidate will have one minute. They will be able to come up to the podium to give their closing statements. Um, and we will be continuing in order, which means we will be starting with Veronica Warner for Ward 9. Again, my name is Veronica Warner. I live in Ward 9, and I work in Ward 9. I have a small business, a little hair studio. I do not only hair, but I do wigs and hair pieces and um, scalp cooling for chemotherapy patients just recently. I will do my best to engage with the people of Ward 9 and bring forth the concerns and issues to City Hall, always reminding myself that this is a position for the people and that I would only be a servant for Ward 9 people. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Hello. Thank you, Veronica. Yes. <laughs> uh, Kyle Thompson for Ward 9. Thank you. <clears throat> Accountability and subsequently trust in politicians is at an all-time low at all levels of government everywhere. I've been campaigning on transparency and a high level of customer service for the taxpayer, and people are responding in a major way. I've been inundated with emails of encouragement and social media support, echoing the sentiment that you see on my signs. The bar is low right now when it comes to advocating for the taxpayer. When you have 800 people in a neighborhood sign a petition telling you they want a piece of their community left alone, and you forge ahead with demolition crews anyways, what are you telling them? When construction's held up forever at MB McEachran, when we need a medical facility there at Lambeth because a Ward 4 councillor decides that it's a heritage site against the wishes of the Lambeth taxpayers, who is working for who? I'm by no means perfect, and I'll be the first to tell you that. 
but I will listen to your concerns. I will get back to you immediately. And most of all, I will raise the bar at City Hall. Thanks. Thank you, Kyle. Matt Miller for Board 9. Well, I won't stand here and talk about all the great plans I have and all the amazing things I'm going to do if I'm elected. I'm not going to make promises that I can't keep, but I will promise to be transparent and keep you informed to the best of my ability. Um, I'm going to come to the community before making big decisions and not after. And everyone deserves to be a part of the political process, and the voice of Ward 9 residents has been ignored for far too long. It's time for someone who truly understands the area and who has real skin in the game to represent us. Thank you, Matt. Gary Manley for Ward 10. If I didn't love London so much as I do, I wouldn't have spent my whole life living here. The city has changed so much from its former days as a fairly quiet, conservative town stuck in the middle of southwest, southwestern Ontario farmland. London has grown in all directions and will continue to grow together with the population in an economy that's more diverse than ever before. I want to see London continue to flourish under a leadership that has the city and its residents' best interests at heart, and I know that I can help to make this happen. And one final word, I'd like to thank the Aeolian Hall and Rogers TV for giving us all the opportunity to speak tonight. And thanks to you, the audience, for taking time to come to this event. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Virginia Ridley for War 10. Thank you. Uh, my thanks to the organizers and for all of you who came here tonight. I know that the night is getting late and uh, people are probably looking forward to getting home shortly. Um, I, I'm going to close uh, not by any pleasantries or anything like that, but I'm going to tell you that this is who I am. What you see is what you get with me. If I make a commitment, I follow through on that. The people who supported me or who heard my campaign promises in 2014 have seen that. Every single day, I'm doing what I said I would do. I put out a monthly newsletter, I do a quarterly meeting, I answer their emails, and I work hard every single day. If I'm reelected to serve in Ward 10, it would be an honor and it would be a privilege that I would be grateful for the opportunity to do again and I would continue to work hard and to do what I've been doing. Thanks. Thank you, Virginia. Anna Hopkins for Ward 9. Thank you again, Christine, and thank you to the candidates. We've been a council that you do not know always how we're going to vote because we come prepared and we are open to being convinced. That is vital to our democracy. Council has made a lot of progress the past four years, digging our way out from a previous council that was dysfunctional. We can't afford go, to go back to the style of rep, that style of representation. I have a different approach. Over the past four years, I've worked to do the nuts and bolts of a city councillor, including keeping taxes low, keeping the roads paved, and attracting businesses to London. At the same time, I've kept an eye on London's future, advocating for affordable housing, better transit, and protecting our environment. I will always listen to your voices. I will continue to do the hard work for your families, protecting our agricultural communities. I will put the necessary work in each day to ensure Byron, Lambeth, Riverbend, Talbot Village remain some of the best neighborhoods to live in. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Paul Van Meerbergen for War 10. Thank you. Um, it's been quite an evening, and I think thanks to you for, uh, for staying here and listening to us. And I'd like to congratulate and thank the uh, candidates for stepping forward, um, all of us. It's quite a commitment. Um, I, I, I'm certainly, it was my pleasure to share my uh, platform with you this evening and the people at home. Uh, the fact of the matter is, I've heard loud and clear from the residents in Ward 10 that the BRT is a non-starter for them. This, we're talking about a vast majority that do not want it. But by the same token, recognizing that it doesn't really help in any way um, getting around our city, they want to see better, better roads, better traffic flow. And that's certainly core to, uh, to what I stand for. So once again, um, thank you. The people of Ward 10 are looking for a representative that represent what they actually want and will deliver on it. Have a good evening. 
Thank you, Paul. Kevin May for Ward 10. I've been sitting down for far too long. Um, I just want to take a few seconds of my time as well to thank all of you here in attendance and thank those that are watching at home. Uh, I believe it's important that we engage in the democratic process, and I thank you all for doing just that. Um, I hope you had an opportunity to kind of understand and, and see who I am as a, as a person and who I will be as a representative. Um, I'm not going to always, I, I will tell you how I feel, um, and I'll do what I feel is right for my community, and um, that's what I stand for. It might not be always be the popular thing, but that's what I, I uh, promise to do. Um, our community has many strengths. There is no other place that I would, my family would rather call home, but we need to build on those strengths and keep moving London forward. As a longtime member of the community, as a father with a young family, and as a leader for a small business that served the community for over 45 years, I've witnessed how this community has grown and understand the everyday challenges that we all face. Over the next coming months, I'll be knocking on every door in Ward 10 and engaging with as many of you as I can. My name's Kevin May, and on October 22nd, I hope to have earned your trust to represent you at City Council. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And for Ward 9, Ben Charlebois. So I'd just like to reiterate uh, my, my thanks to everybody for coming out and, uh, and for asking great questions. It's really heartening to see an engaged, such a large engaged group of people coming out here on a work night. Um, Prior to getting involved, prior to getting involved in politics and ending, and uh, and working in government, I worked for a small family business in Southwest London. That um, it's a it's a law firm that that helps employers and helps businesses um, across the city and across the province try to keep their bottom line down. I know what it's like to advocate for people, and I know what it's like to fight for somebody that you care about. And I'm absolutely going to fight for the people of Ward 9 at City Hall, but. This election, you have a choice to make, and it's whether or not you want to, whether or not you want to with, use your vote to support uh, somebody with a vision, somebody who wants to see the bigger picture and wants to create a bigger picture for not just Ward 9, but for all of London. Whether or not we want to be, whether or not we want to remain the last major city in Ontario without rapid transit. Whether or not we want to invest in arts and culture. And, and let uh, let our neighboring cities get an edge on us. So I hope on October 22nd, I will have your vote so that I can go to city council and demand that we create a plan and that we stick to a plan that allows people in Ward 9 and, and all of London to live their best lives and want to continue living their best lives here in London. Thank you. I want to thank all of the candidates here for having the guts and the passion to get up on stage and answer your questions for the past two and a half hours. Let's give them a big round of applause. And I want to thank all of you who had the dedication to come out here tonight to spend your time to really be informed so that we can choose the best city council on October 22nd. Thank you to you. Give yourselves a round of applause, please. Most of all, I want to thank the Aeolian Hall for organizing and hosting these events. This really is a hub in our community for arts and culture, and it's a hub for conversation as well. So thank you uh, to the Aeolian. Please give them a round as well. And that's it. I uh, just want to remind you when the polls close on October 22nd, be sure to tune in to Rogers TV for in-depth analysis of the results. I will be there. You should be too. Uh, until then, I'm Christine Tileski. Thanks so much. Have a great night. Get home safe. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media.
The way London votes has changed. This October, we'll be the first city in Canada to use ranked choice voting. Voters will have more choices with the option to rank first, second, and third choices for mayor and city councillor. Learn more at london.ca slash election. With Showcase, feel free to savor the suspense. What did you do to your parents? They died. To binge the blockbusters. Let's go to war. I don't think you've ever known a woman like me. Feel free to feel the power. I'm Luke Skywalker. I'm here to rescue you. I know. Feel free with Showcase. Now in free preview. Bladder cancer. It's the fifth most common cancer in Canada. The main warning sign of bladder cancer is blood in the urine. So if you see red, see your doctor. Finding a cure for bladder cancer won't be a walk in the park, but it's a great place to start. Please show your support and register for the Bladder Cancer Canada Awareness Walk at bccwalk.ca. Rogers TV.